Hello, this is Ipo Swords, and today we're going to be looking at this, a French staff officer's sword from around 1814 to 1815. It has many unique elements of symbolism, in the hilt and on the blade, which we're going to be examining in detail in order to date this accurately. However, we must of course begin more generally. This sword was of someone on the staff office, someone who would have been working under Berthier in the Paris branch. These staff officers were in charge of things like logistics, secretariat matters, and other such internal political affairs in the Napoleonic military establishment. As such, it was not expected to be used in combat, and as a result, the spadroon is the perfect form factor. It features a court sword style hilt and a single edged blade with a double edged foible in a lozenge cross section. It has one fuller and is blued and gilt on the blade. We'll be working from the pommel down to the very tip of the blade, examining its various interesting features and using two sources to contextualize it. The first being Jean Lahost's Le Epée and the second being Andrew Roberts' Napoleon the Great. We will begin at the logical starting point, that being the pommel. The pommel on this sword, for which its family is named in Jean Lahost's Les Epées, features what becomes a recurring theme throughout the hilt and indeed the blade of this sword. That is the theme of the acanthus. This acanthus or foliate theme begins with this ring of foliage in the form of leaves or petals around the pommel where it joins the knuckle bow. This is also seen slightly lower down on the pommel proper in the form of two acanthus flowers on opposing sides, which are highlighted on screen now. As we move further down the hilt, we reach the very nicely preserved Mother of Pearl panels, which are inscribed with lines in a fluted fashion and have only a small amount of chipping on only one side. These are flanked by fairly well preserved panels of gilt metal, which I'm not sure is the same metal as the rest of the hilt due to the fact that it has adhered to the gilding much, much better. However, this could be due to the style of casting. Furthermore, we can look at the knuckle bow, which actually features a lion head, an interesting feature considering this is a Napoleonic sword. However, this is explained by the fact that this is late Napoleonic in his well and truly imperial stage. You see, early Napoleonic, shied away from using Bourbon symbols like the lion. However, later Napoleonic symbols, wanting to be more regal, included things like the earlier Bourbon lion, considering them apt to the status of the new Emperor Napoleon. As we continue down, you can see the ferrule, which also features a foliate theme in the form of either fern leaves or canvas leaves, I can't quite tell which. And the entire thing is made of a gilt yellow metal. It's a rather aesthetically attractive hilt. However, the pièce de résistance is of course the clamshell guard. This of course brings us to the front guard, which is the aforementioned pièce de résistance of this sword. We'll begin with the salient image and radiate our way outwards. That salient image of course being the winged victory that we see in the center of the guard. This winged victory was initially a classical element brought from ancient Greece in the neoclassical revival that we see in the Napoleonic era. The winged victory, as the name would imply, is a victorious symbol, something very suitable to the agenda of the newly returned from exile Napoleon. In the hand of the winged victory on one side is a vine leaf, and in the other hand is a laurel wreath the laurel wreath being another classical symbol transposed to the early modern era of the early 18th century. On the right flank of our winged victory we can see a facès, or a bound bundle of wood, from which the modern word fascism is derived. It is a symbol of unity and power in government, thus its co-opting by fascist movements in the 20th century, and thus its naming of these movements that we now know as fascism. Below the facets, and indeed on the left side of the winged victory, we can see flagpoles, one of which is flying a fringed flag, or rather a battle standard, another useful symbol for a recently returned 
Napoleon, who was about to embark on yet another campaign. Working our way even further, on the top right and left of this front guard, you can see the final aspect of the acanthus decoration on the hilt, that being two small acanthus flowers in small circular rings. That concludes our portion on the front guard, now we'll move on to the blade, which is, as mentioned before, a spadroon blade, the darling of the internet. This spadroon blade features a blued and gilt blade. This would have been performed via fire gilding, a very dangerous profession for any metal worker to perform. Fire gilding used an amalgam of mercury and gold, where the mercury was burnt off, thus the name fire gilding, letting off mercury fumes and baking the gold onto the blade, as gold in its natural form will not attach to steel. This leaves it with this strong blue colour and the golden overlay. At the base of this bluing panel you can see my favourite feature of any sword, that being the floral bluing terminus. I actually have another sword with this bluing terminus which also has a Solingen made blade like this one. It was a popular style from around 1808 to 1820 among the uber riche who could afford their very expensive floral terminus on their sword, which required a significant amount more work to perform than just a straight terminus. Moving on from a bluing panel, we have the termination of the fuller and the transition from a single edge to a double edged lozenge cross section. In a broader, more functional blade, this would increase the ability to perform cuts with the false edge and also increase thrusting potential by creating a symmetric point. However, this is an extremely narrow spadroon with a weight of only 415 grams at an overall length of 96 centimeters, meaning that no matter how functional the design premise is, it's too narrow and too light to actually work. This does, however, make it perfect for its intended use, being pretty at the side of a uniform. This is further emphasized by the fact that it has only a single clamshell lacking the symmetrical one on the other side, so it would not rub your uniform. This also means it has worse hand protection, is more flexible, and is lighter than a 1796 Spadroon. That's right, this is worse than the perfect encumbrance. Despite its lack of true functional capabilities, I think this is a fantastic sword with a gorgeous aesthetic, which fulfilled its actual purpose perfectly well. For someone in the staff office who was tasked with logistics and secretariat duties, this would have been the perfect accompaniment. And it would have looked lovely on their embroidered uniforms when they went out to courtly functions and balls, as officers of the gallant and rich sort were wont to do at the time. As much as it's not a functional piece of weaponry, it is a very much so functional piece of fashion, which was the true purpose of a spadroon for a French officer of the era, even if that spadroon has a German-made blade with a continental European-style bluing panel. That's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, stay sharp.